Topic 4.2, access to fresh water. Previously, we saw that most of the water of the world is actually seawater, a little over 97%. Basically, only about 3% is fresh water, and of that fresh water, only about 1% is easily accessible, that is, in lakes and rivers and so forth. And so, with a burgeoning population in the world, access to water is becoming more of an issue. I know we tend to think about gold and silver, platinum and so forth as being valuable minerals, but if you really think about it, the most valuable resource on the planet is really water. Life is simply not possible without water for plants and animals, and it's becoming a scarcer and scarcer resource. So, unfortunately, since water, fresh water is so scarce, uh, a significant part of the world's population goes without. It's, it's a real, real problem. And if you go to countries like India and so forth, one of the fastest growing businesses is actually guys just selling bottles of water there. This problem has become worse with climate change, which is bringing on droughts in some area. And unfortunately, all these conditions that affect water are affecting LEDCs much more than MEDCs. Pound for pound, the poor are simply just paying a lot more for water than the rest of us. This is an unsustainable situation, and uh, LEDCs, unfortunately, are going to have to change their water access because as demand gets higher and population goes up, things like agricultural need more water, and they, they've just got to switch to something else or else something needs to be done about the global problem. So how can we go ahead and make water access sustainable? Well, I suppose the easiest way, what we've been doing, is just building reservoirs. Uh, don't let the water run off. Capture it. Store it. Great idea. So in uh, our area that we live in here in the Northwest, we get most of our water from Mount Hood, the glaciers. It melts. It comes down to Sandy, where there's the Bull Run Reservoir. It is stored there. It then gets piped down to Portland, where it's stored in another reservoir in uh, Washington uh, Park and then it's distributed out. And so you could also have a distribution system. So um, there are many parts of the country that are not yet having trouble with water, and they can then distribute their water to other places. So for example, California a number of years ago built the peripheral canal. It goes down the uh, center vertically of California, and it takes water from the water-rich north and distributes it to the water-scarce south. More expensive ways to do it would be something like desalinization. Um, you could take the 97% of ocean water and try and remove the salt. This takes a lot of energy. You need to evaporate, distill the water. If you have the money, like many countries in the Middle East, I suppose that's an alternative you would have, but not really feasible on a long-term basis. Conservation, obviously, would be a good way. Let's just not let the water tap run all the time. Let's have uh, toilets that use less water. Let's not water our lawns during the summertime. Unfortunately, if you look at the um, distribution of water, it goes something like this. About 80% of water is used for agriculture, 15% for industries, and only about 5% personal use. So it's very nice for us to say I'm not going to water my lawn and so forth, but we're only 5% personal use, and it doesn't really make a big difference. It's really, you have to find a difference in agriculture. That's really where most of the water is being used up. What type of solutions could we have for the problems? Well, again, we get back to what we learned in Unit 1, ecocentric, anthropocentric, and technocentric. Depends on your environmental value system to address the problem of water availability. And there's no shortage of guys who have ideas here, uh, technical solutions here, more efficient sprinklers. Uh, we could do hydroponics, I suppose, and not use uh, soil and control the amount of water that we're putting in there. We could go ahead and um, have uh, legislation that would limit the amount of water people can use. I know in Portland, even though we have a lot of water here, Water is actually very expensive. I can't believe my bill I get each month, and that's because there's all sorts of restrictions. When you use above a certain amount, you get charged at higher rates and so forth. 
When you can't solve these problems, sustainability, people got to have water. So um, there's no way around it. So there's going to be conflicts. So as we have more reliance on groundwater, uh, which is not renewable, and as we have more reliance on uh, surface water, which is a small percentage, we're going to have wars, civil unrest, shortages, right? A good example is what's going on in Egypt and Ethiopia. They've been building dams there. So the Nile basically is the lifeline for that part of the world. I can't remember what it is, 90 or 95% or something like that of the population of Egypt lives right along the Nile River. Uh, all the agriculture in uh, Egypt is along the Nile River. And the water flows from deeper down, and it comes through a number of countries there in the um, Nile Basin. And they're all building dams and taking out water and fighting over it. And unfortunately, Egypt is, is at the end of the line. So uh, even though they have the largest population of that area, they're not getting their share of water. We see the same thing happening uh, in the United States over in the west area. As the Colorado River comes down there, Los Angeles is dipping into it. Las Vegas is dipping into it. And by the time we get down to Phoenix, they're really having uh, water issues. And as we speak right now, there was a, an agreement a few years ago between all those states in there to manage the water. And I think, unfortunately, that agreement just broke down. So I'm not sure where we're going to go on that.